Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Well, first of all, before I start uh, this afternoon, I uh, should probably introduce my uh, IT person here. Uh, <laughs> this is Elijah Bird, and uh, he's my grandson, and uh, he's helped me quite a bit with this uh, presentation. Uh, this is a not a PowerPoint presentation, but it's a Prezi presentation. So, um, <clears throat> several months ago, I was uh, privileged to attend the 10th annual meeting of the American Dream Coalition in Denver, Colorado. As with each meeting of the American Dream Coalition, we begin with a tour of the city in which we are meeting, focusing primarily on a couple of issues, focusing on transportation projects and also land use projects. In Denver, uh, we began with the $1.5 billion remodel of the Union Station complex, which is the heart of the city's light rail system. And you can see here, this is very modernistic um, on the outside. And then uh, in the uh, center of the picture, you can see Union Station. Uh, they, they did a nice job uh, refurbishing that too. <laughs> we were briefed by uh, one of the Rapid Transit District's board members uh, about the uh, light rail system in Denver. We learned uh, mostly about the recently completed part of the light rail system, the west uh, side, uh, which goes from downtown Denver to Golden, Colorado. We learned that the projected cost was $43 million per mile. Actual cost, $60 million per mile. Projected boardings, 30,000 per day. Actual boardings, 11,500 per day. We also learned, of course, that there had to be some rezoning of the area where the light rail uh, went through. Uh, and part of this uh, rezoning um, brought about multi-story buildings uh, to create greater density along the tracks. Well, at the same time, banning businesses with drive throughs We actually uh, rode the light rail to its western end in Golden, and here is the western end of it. Uh, when we got there, our bus was there to meet us. And from the uh, west end, we traveled from Golden, Colorado uh, to Boulder, Colorado. This aerial shot uh, shows the beautiful setting of Boulder home to the University of Colorado, and also home to many land regulations, and also a green belt surrounding the city uh, that makes uh, Boulder, Colorado one of the most expensive places to live in America. Another rather expensive place to live in uh, the Denver area is the Stapleton area of Denver. Uh, Stapleton is where the old Denver Stapleton Airport used to be located at before the present airport was built. Uh, focusing on uh, new urban development or smart growth in the Stapleton area, uh, we have in this picture here uh, many, pit many uh, aspects of smart growth. Uh, first of all, dense housing. You can see those houses are relatively new, but they're very close to each other. There are small yards, or really no yards at all. And also, uh, with smart growth, uh, there's the uh, use of porches. Uh, the idea being that people will sit out on their porches, people be walking on their sidewalks, and they can converse with each other. With smart growth, there's an attempt to uh, reduce the use of vehicles. However, I think you can see in this picture, that hasn't been very successful yet. After our tour of the Denver metro area, we settled down to various presentation by a diverse group of people, uh, some 30. You can see this includes professors, community activists, authors, lawyers, and members of various think tanks. <clears throat> because of the limited time, 
I will focus on three presentations, beginning first of all with the Metropolitan Council. Now some of you might be familiar with the Metropolitan Council. Uh, I'm talking about the Metro Council in the Twin Cities. <clears throat> um, the presentation on the Metropolitan Council was done by Catherine Kirsten, who is with the Center of the American Experiment, which is based in the Twin Cities. <clears throat> The uh, Metropolitan Council covers seven counties. You can see them here on this map, but it also includes 186 municipalities. The council itself consists of unelected officials. And uh, this is something that sometimes can cause problems uh, in the Twin Cities because sometimes the actions of the council override elected officials. Uh, it's not a particularly democratic body. The powers of the Metro Council in the cities, uh, it acts like a um, metro planning organization, an MPO. It engages in regional planning, uh, waste and water issues, housing, and also even taxes. Why am I mentioning this Metro Council in uh, the cities? Well, in a sense, uh, Lewis and Clark uh, is somewhat, somewhat like a Metro Council, uh, consisting of unelected officials and run by 20 uh, directors. And on this uh, board of uh, Lewis and Clark, we have one vote. And so, you know, sometimes we have to be concerned that uh, Sioux Falls, even though we uh, spend a lot of money on Lewis and Clark and use a lot of the water, we can be outvoted. And also at the same time, the reason I'm bringing this up is maybe we can understand a little bit better about why Brandon is concerned about losing control over wastewater. Uh, that's the concern of many of these municipalities in the Twin Cities area, that they've lost control over different functions. The second presentation I'd like to mention <clears throat> uh, deals with Westchester County, New York. Um, Where's Westchester County, New York? Well, it's the county just north of New York City. Approximately a million people live there, and it's a very diverse county. Um, some 50% of the people are uh, white, uh, white, and then the rest are various ethnicities. Uh, the presenter in this uh, presentation was Cornelius Morose, uh, a resident of Westchester County. <clears throat> And what she uh, focused on was what the um, uh, federal government's housing and urban development uh, was dealing with um, Westchester County uh, in trying to um, test out a new rule that HUD has come up with. And this new rule is called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule. This uh, rule is uh, designed to try to make sure there is the mixing of racial groups and the mixing of the rich and poor groups within the county of Westchester. Uh, we've got a little bit ahead of here on, on the slides, but now you can keep it there, Elijah. I think this is probably one of the reasons why Westchester is you know, being looked at by HUD because there are a number of very expensive uh, mansions uh, within the Westchester area. But as the uh, people of Westchester uh, would also like to focus on, there's also many, many diverse groups and uh, many people of middle income and even lower income. This rule, this affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, was published September 26, 2014, so just a couple of months ago, in the Federal Registry. Final comment on the rule was November 20th, 25th, 2014, so just a few days ago. This rule will be going into effect and will affect Sioux Falls because we have a situation here where the feds are becoming more involved in land zoning and wanting to make sure that neighborhoods are fully integrated. Possibly, they want to maybe make a 
better mix of the rich and poor here in Sioux Falls. Also different races, they might want to try to uh, make sure there's a better mix of that in Sioux Falls. So this is something we might be anticipating in the near future. The final presenter I'd like to mention is uh, Lawrence McQuillan. Uh, he's from the Independent Institute in San Francisco. Now, to really understand his perspective, um, we have here the title of a piece that he wrote entitled, Highway Robbery, How Your Taxes Subsidize the California Lifestyle. Well, how do our taxes subsidize the California lifestyle? Well, he focused on the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, every time we buy gasoline, we pay 18.4 cents per gallon. And of course, this money goes into a trust fund and is supposed to be for highways and bridges. <clears throat> However, he contends that this is becoming a slush fund for surface trams, tra transportation, anything but roads and bridges. And that means we have a lot of this trust fund money being used for mass transit. And he gave a very good example in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in 2013, $1 billion uh, was spent from the trust fund in the Bay Area. What on? Walkways, bike paths, scenic overlooks, and even local government purchasing land for open space. Why am I mentioning this? Well, because the more money that's taken out of the trust fund for non-highway projects means less money for highways and bridges. And of course, that affects South Dakota highways. Uh, like uh, South Dakota Highway 100 and also the building of city streets. Uh, in fact, it's even anticipated in this upcoming legislative session in Pier that we're probably going to be having some increased taxes in South Dakota to pay for some more highways and bridges. Finally, I would like to uh, show two other slides. <clears throat> This is a bridge over the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon to uh, Vancouver, uh, Washington. Uh, Portland, Oregon is uh, on the bottom of the slide. Vancouver is in the upper portion of the slide. Why am I showing you this slide? Well, something unique happened here just very recently. That maybe I should also point out that that uh, bridge there is I-5 that goes from San Diego up to Seattle. But there's no parallel bridge to the I-5 bridge there. Um, for many years, uh, there was an attempt to build a parallel bridge to the I-5 bridge to allow light rail to go from Portland, they have light rail in Portland, to Vancouver. The cost of the projected bridge was $4 billion. However, as of May 2014, the bridge project was canceled, officially canceled, because of citizen opposition. When you have two governments, like the government of uh, Oregon and the government of uh, Washington State, uh, wanting a bridge and the citizens um, stopping it, that doesn't happen very often at all. The next slide I'd like to show you is of the Rochester city lines. And um, this is a privately owned bus line in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, the Rochester city lines used to operate all the bus service in Rochester. And then we had the city uh, taking over a, a lot of the bus lines. However, this private bus line has continued to operate in Rochester. Uh, does a lot of uh, uh, busing for commuters into Rochester. but. Why am I showing you this slide? What does this have to do with Sioux Falls? Well, the, uh, a couple of the members of the family that owns this private bus line uh, were at the conference in Denver. And I learned that uh, they used to own a private bus line here in Sioux Falls. In fact, they owned the last privately owned bus line in Sioux Falls in 1979 is when they left Sioux Falls. And then that's when the city of Sioux Falls uh, took over uh, the bus service in um, 
uh, Sioux Falls itself. Well now, uh, at this time, uh, does anybody have any questions at all? Anybody? Counselors? <clears throat> Counselor Staggers, thank okay. you. Appreciate oh, thank you very your presentation much. Uh-huh, sure. Your uh, tech support also. Yeah, that really enhanced it. <laughs> Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on. <laughs>